you very much for, for inviting me. My relation to uh, Portugal is an old one and a precious one. I am French, but I went to the U.S. to get a PhD at MIT. Uh, and most of my professional life has been uh, at MIT. I was a professor at MIT for a very long time. Uh, from basically the late uh, 1970s uh, to 2008. In 2008, I was asked, uh, I was offered the position of chief economist of the IMF. Uh, I went uh, before knowing that there would be a financial crisis. I arrived just at the start of it. And so uh, the work was, was definitely uh, interesting. Uh, and I stayed there from 2008 to 2015. At which point I had to decide whether to go back to academia or stay in Washington. And I decided that given my interest in policy, I would join a think tank and I joined the Patterson Institute for International Economics, which I think is a great think tank. And I've been there uh, ever since. Uh, my relation to Portugal right, dates back to, uh, to when I was working on unemployment and I was struck by the nature of unemployment in Portugal, in particular in relation to unemployment in Spain or unemployment in the US. And I was uh, blessed um, to uh, be able to work with Pedro Portugal, who seemed to know uh, every single individual history uh, in, uh, in Portugal. He had access and he had put together this incredible data set. So we wrote a number of papers together. And uh, that made me very much interested in, in, in Portugal. And I was very happy to join uh, PEG, uh, which I think has done, has done very well and is writing, uh, is producing uh, good, good papers. So I was happy to do my share. I did it uh, um, a bit more at the beginning than I stayed for, I think, 20 years on it, but I was not very active. And I've decided it's, it's time to uh, you know, give responsibilities to, uh, to others. So uh, you asked me about the future of microeconomics, which is understanding the behavior of, of aggregates. Uh, and uh, it has a bright future because there are a lot of interesting questions and we have more and more data sets uh, to answer them. There is kind of a nearly philosophical question, which is, can you actually understand the economy by looking uh, at aggregates? And uh, I think one of the lessons of a uh, global financial crisis is in some cases you actually have to go far beyond aggregates. You have to go to the granular level because what mattered in the financial crisis was not any aggregate. It was, you know, who did Lehman owe money to? Who was owing money to Lehman? And you have to have a level of understanding at that level to understand the financial sector. So there's a bit of a tension. Uh, looking at aggregates may not get you um, way into the information you desperately need sometimes. The other thing which is uh, characterizing macro at this stage is, uh, you know, the influence of, I would say, at Prescott, uh, which is the RBC, or Real Business Cycle Theory. The idea that you have to start from micro foundations and you have to stick with it. And I have very mixed views. Uh, on the one hand, it's clear that micro foundations are, are, are useful. Whether we can get uh, reliable micro foundations or pretend micro foundations, I think is an open issue. The issue of aggregation of decisions, uh, there are a few famous theorems which say that even if people satisfy all the axioms of rationality, which they don't, uh, then the aggregate demand, for example, has absolutely no restriction on it. Uh, so. There's this philosophical issue, which is, uh, can you actually do it? What is often done is kind of reverse engineering, going back from some relation which seems stable to the kind of assumptions which were generated, which I think is pseudoscience to a large extent. Uh, but at the same time, it has, compared to where, when I was a student, uh, created more integration of micro theory and macro theory, which is probably good. We just have to find the right mix. I think we are all struggling with it. I mean, I try to be very much consistent with micro foundations in what I th think, what I write, uh, but I don't try to necessarily start from, you know, some individual equation. I think aggregation is a big issue. Uh, 
I think we're still struggling with this. So one of the incarnations uh, is the so-called DSGE, or dynamic stochastic general equilibrium mode. And they are ugly beasts, and they are in a way wrong in assumptions, and they are very black boxy, very hard to understand exactly why they generate what they generate. There is not enough partial equilibrium work, which allows you to understand some part of the economy better. So we're still struggling with it. It may uh, It's now uh, nearly a 50-year struggle. Uh, it may be another uh, few, uh, few decades before we actually emerge from with a consensus. Uh, it's a very exciting field. Uh, again, the questions are fascinating. And, and, and I think in many cases, we're not far from having some answers. Again, I think there are many dimensions. Uh, the, the question is about the effect of AI on on on, uh, on labor markets and, and people. Uh, first thing is AI uh, may actually increase productivity so much that we all need to work less uh, than we would otherwise, uh, which would be good. We would have more time for leisure. I mean, the, you know, the extreme cliche is we all stay home and the robots do everything. We will not get there, but we probably going to go in that direction. So I would expect that the uh, hours of work per week will, at least in advanced economies, uh, continue to, to decrease. That's good news. The bad news is the distributional one, which is, uh, is it going to eliminate kind of a least skilled jobs? Um, uh, and the people who have those jobs and have limited skills uh, will not be able to get any job, in which case we would have to consider some kind of universal income or something like this. And I think we don't know the answer to this. It's clear that AI can substitute or can complement uh, low skills. I, you know, take an example in medicine, uh, you can think of AI uh, allowing nurses to actually do the job of doctors or a good part of the job of doctors which would be very good for nurses not so good for doctors but you know doctors are at the top of the scale so it would be good or it could be that they just displace uh, nurses in which case it would be an issue and you have that kind of issue all along the uh, the skill ladder um, the one policy question is whether we can help especially for technologies at the low end of, uh, of a skill ladder, can we basically make them make the research about AI be directed to jobs to AI which complements uh, low skill workers, such as, for example, you know, making it easier for cashiers in supermarkets to do what they do without replacing them, or to replace them, and. They have a question on which people like Danny Roderick or Daron Asimov Blue and others have worked is, can we actually give incentives uh, for research to go in the right direction? And there, I think there are, there are big issues, which is, uh, how do we define the direction? What kind of incentives do we give? Uh, but it may become a very central policy issue. And I think the, uh, a gloom and doom scenario doesn't have zero probability in the same way as a good scenario doesn't have zero probability. Uh, but we'll have to kind of monitor this very, very, very closely. What advice would I give to somebody who is starting a PhD in 2023? I think it's the same advice I would have given uh, in, in, in uh, 1970, which is uh, accept that you have to learn a lot of techniques uh, because economics and econometrics uh, in general has become uh, much more technical. And these techniques are useful, but don't be obsessed by them. Uh, and the idea is to master them and then be creative. Never write a paper because somebody else has written a paper and there's something more that you can do with it. You may have no choice that once in a while writing a paper like this, but you should always be what is happening in the world? What is an issue that is absolutely central in which you, know, uh, you think the research hasn't gone where it should? And again, work on this. It's hard. Um, in terms of the job market, you will need to show that you dominate the techniques, but it should really be at the service of, of an interesting question. And I see some theses which are uh, more obsessed with 
just the next step, uh, but it's not very creative or obsessed by technique. Again, there's some need for people to develop techniques, but I don't think there's a need for more than a minority to do that. Um, creativity. Uh, are you answering a question which will make the world eventually a bit better? Is what I, is the advice I would give.